In the past generation, the science of our seas has undergone a revolution. As the ice caps melt and coral reefs face destruction, the urgency to understand our oceans has never been greater. At the heart of these world-changing discoveries are agencies such as the United Nations Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and the Global Ocean Observing System. It's terrific that the steering team is meeting here um, in South America. They provide global coordination for scientists like Dr. Susan Wafels, an oceanographer at CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency. Together, they are working to extend our scientific understanding of extreme weather. One thing I'm really interested in is how the ocean's changing, especially over long time scales. And so what we've been working on is taking data from the modern ocean observing system, so what the modern ocean looks like, and comparing it to the ocean 10, 20, 30, 40 or 50 years ago. We can look at the patterns of change and the rates of change and compare that with the models uh, that we use to predict future climate, how well they do for the last 50 years. We should care about the oceans because they really determine our weather and climate that, that we live in, our environment. It's those oceans, those, the anchors of our climate system, the flywheel of our climate system, they're going to be basically uh, dictating our future to some extent. It's only through that international partnership and using lots of new technologies that we're going to be able to get the information we need about how the ocean is changing and evolving. Unnoticed by many outside a close-knit circle of oceanographers, a global network has been created using thousands of remote-controlled robots to monitor for the first time dramatic changes in the oceans. And these are the two-meter-long robots that have revolutionized ocean science. They cost $10,000 each, and there are new ones being deployed constantly to beam back new data to scientists across the world. These robots of the sea are known as Argo floats. They have changed everything. It's taken us a long time to get where we are today in observing the oceans because the technologies that were needed to get to where we are did not exist 20 years ago. These technologies of autonomous instruments that can operate um, unattended by themselves out on the ocean, freely drifting for periods of years. As these Argo floats drift, they collect temperature and salinity measurements up to a depth of 2,000 meters, gathering essential information for scientists to better understand the changes that are taking place within the seas. Over the last 50 years, there's some very clear things that we can see have changed in the ocean. The first most prominent one is that it's warmed. Uh, at the surface, we see a broader warming of the ocean that tracks the warming of the land. So Argo is what we call a broad scale observing system. It, it's mapping the very broad scale uh, structure of the ocean and how it varies and changes. And the idea is to take these very um, rather simple robots that we call them profiling floats and we want to put one of these floats out in the ocean, basically one float every 300 kilometres in latitude and longitude. When the floats are deployed, they drop down to their drift depth one kilometre deep in the ocean. The float drifts for about nine days at that depth. At the end of the ninth day, the float drops down even further to two kilometres depth and switches on its sensor package and starts measuring temperature and salinity all the way from two kilometres 
back up to the surface of the ocean. This probe beams the information collected to a satellite system that geolocates the float and delivers the data to a ground station. The cycle is repeated for between five and nine years. Unusual among research projects, this real-time data is made freely available on the internet within 24 hours. You know, we have 3,000 of these floats now telling us uh, what the vertical temperature profile is in the ocean. And then we take that information and we can build month by month a picture of where the heat is building up in the ocean uh, or where the ocean's cooling down. And that in turn feeds back to climate variability. Another change that we can now see with Argo data is the contrast between the more saline areas and the less saline areas of the ocean. Those changes are telling us that the water cycle, the movement of moisture through the atmosphere that feeds our rainfall, has intensified, which means it has become drier in dry regions and wetter in wet regions. And these new areas of scientific understanding are thanks in no small part to the Argo floats. The evidence they collect makes the role of oceanographers central to our understanding of the most important changes in the world's climate. No single nation can monitor the world's oceans on its own. So the UN agencies of the IOC and the World Meteorological Organization are key to maintaining the international dimension of Argo. They support a small but vital unit in Toulouse in southern France. It's this high-tech nerve center which coordinates the Argo program 24 hours a day. Each float costs 30,000 US dollars to make and run. The entire program comes in annually at a cost of 24 million US dollars. Funding this important project is an ongoing quest. The main challenge of Argo uh, is to get those instruments at sea. Uh, they live four or five years, so they can make about 150 10-day cycles. So we need to renew every year uh, uh, part of the array. Basically, we need to deploy 800 units per year. So that's a huge logistical challenge. Uh, so one of the activities of the Argo Information Center is to help all the scientists to get their floats uh, 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 in the ocean. We're starting to really now see very clear patterns of that long-term change in the ocean. And Argo's been a key uh, facilitator in that because we have such now a very clear modern baseline upon which to compare our older data. I feel quite strongly in that's, you know, observations are one of the most fundamental things about science. What I'm doing now and the sorts of things that we're learning about the Earth system is going to assist her and future generations in managing life, really, and our environment. And so, you know, that's also an inspiration in the sense that um, we really want to, to uh, get a better handle on what's happening so there won't be any bad surprises <laughs> in the future.